Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Alex. I'm from Uber. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here today to talk to you with you about deep learning and HPC. Uh, so my session is about Uber's deep learning journey. And um, I'm going to start with why are we even talking about deep learning these days so much? Uh, so this is one of the slides by Andrew NG, who is one of the deep learning superstars. Uh, he's basically arguing that if you grow amount of data, which all the big companies these days are doing, uh, efficiency of um, traditional machine learning algorithms starts to taper off. So your, um, even you have much more data, your accuracy, your performance is not growing that much. And as companies started to adopt deep learning, what they saw is that you can get qualit qualitatively better results with more data, which is different. Uh, and that's why a lot of industries right now are adopting deep learning and getting much better results than they were getting before. Uh, so how do we use it in Uber? We have a lot of um, business divisions and a lot of uh, problems that we can tackle with deep learning. So for example, self-driving vehicles, which is both cars and trucks, there is very many areas inside the, that system that can leverage deep learning. For example, computer vision problems, planning problems, um, all those things can leverage deep learning. Uh, trip forecasting, so for example, we need to know how many people will want to drive on New Year Eve, which is very peak time for us, uh, and as well as for any other day, so we can uh, decide how much we need to incentivize our drivers to show up. Um, and for fraud, for example, fraud detection, where we need to make sure that there is no fraud, fraudulent activity and we're not spending money um, on things that we shouldn't be spending on. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how deep learning works and ultimately why is it HPC problem. Uh, so typically you have deep learning is basically multi-layered model, each of which is um, doing some matrix operations. Uh, and you would have data on one side then it goes through multiple transformations, which may be just sequential, but sometimes it may have some branching or recurrent loops. And then in the end, you get prediction. Uh, so, and then how do you train this model? So in order to train it, basically what you do after you get the outputs of every layer, you compare output the final layer with ground truth result, and then you can start computing deltas to make that, ground, that prediction a little better, a little closer to ground truth. So we compute these gradients, and that gradient computation is going backwards, which is why it's called backpropagation. So basically, you need to compute the whole model. Then you can compute your last layer gradient, and then you can go back and compute the rest of the gradients. And after you compute all the gradients, you can update the model and repeat the situation again. So these iterations happen. Um, more than once a second. And size of this model is pretty large, so which, uh, which can be hundreds of megabytes or gigabytes, which uh, is why this starts to endeavor in HPC land. Um, so in Uber, we use different deep learning frameworks. And one of the biggest frameworks that we use is TensorFlow. There is a few reasons for that. One is its most popular deep learning framework. As of time of writing this, it had 84,000 stars on GitHub. And by now, I bet it's much more. Uh, so as a result of that, we ha it's much easier for new researchers coming into the field to leverage existing examples, because it's much more likely that previous researchers would publish papers with some reference TensorFlow code, or somebody would port code to TensorFlow. Uh, and there is a big community around TensorFlow for creating custom operations, um, documentation, and all those things. Um, TensorFlow by itself allows you to do both kind of prototyping and um, production. So it's pretty easy to um, create model together, iterate on it pretty fast, and then once you're done iterating, you can deploy it to production. Uh, so that's the benefit over some other frameworks which are just optimized for, let's say, development or for production. Um, and then it has, yeah, it has end-to-end -end support. And also you can do, uh, while you can use high-level primitives with TensorFlow, at the same time, for things that you know how to optimize better, uh, you can create custom CUDA kernels and custom operations, which will be, which allow you to 
bring your model under the performance budget that you have. For example, if you are doing car and you need to run inference X number of frames per second, you really need to optimize every operation. But luckily, TensorFlow will mostly be there, and you just need to optimize a few things to precisely match your requirements. Uh, so as we gathered more data and started to train more models, we were seeing that some of the teams would train their models for, let's say, a couple of weeks. And that was bad because that means that even though you can start multiple experiments at the same time, you would not uh, infer uh, search space that you are, as a research scientist, exploring uh, until you get results from experiments. So because of that, what would happen is you would try to explore many things, but then you would see that most of the things actually failed. In, however, if what you could do, if you could run every experiment much faster, let's say instead of 20 experiments, you would run one experiment, but 20 times faster, you would be able to linearize experiments, but at the same time, every successful, ex suc every next experiment would be informed by all the previous successes or failures. So your path towards solution will be much quicker. So that's why we were doing uh, distributed, we started exploring distributed training. And there is two ways to do distributed training. One is model parallelism, and one is data parallelism. And yesterday, uh, there was discussion as well doing mixed approaches. So with model parallelism, you have models so huge that you need to spread it across many devices. And with data parallelism, your model fits on a single device, and you can spread the data. So you can, um, in the latter case, you can basically feed the data independently, and then only at certain points synchronize the model. Um, in our case, what we found is most of our problems fit into single GPU or single server. And modern GPUs have a lot of memory. So it was OK for us to focus on data parallelism use case. Uh, and we're also very inspired by work of Facebook, where they published uh, scaling ResNet and traded it in one hour on 256 GPUs. And they demonstrated what uh, learning rate adjustment technique you need to use in order to make it work. Um, so here on the right, there is a um, kind of diagram showing how distributed data parallel work, training works. Uh, basically, you have multiple training processes. Every process would ingest portion of the data, run um, model computation. And then for uh, every process, you would compute gradients based on that data that you read. And then afterwards, you average gradients, and you apply those average gradients to the model, and you repeat the situation. So, and then as, as I was saying before, let's say if your model is a few gigabytes, and you're, you're doing this update every second, and let's say you have 100 servers, then this becomes a HPC problem, because you have a few gigabytes that you need to exchange uh, every second. Um, so we started using traditional TensorFlow to do that. And we're using parameter server approach, which is default for TensorFlow. And what we found is there is a few problems with that. One is uh, usability. From developer perspective, you basically need to learn a lot of um, concepts. So let's say you're your PhD who have machine learning degree now, and you want to create a new model. But when you start to do distributed training, what you have to do is you need to learn all these new concepts about towers, uh, replica device setters, sync replica optimizers, and things like that, which were necessary there for doing very complicated model structure, let's say model parallelism training, but not necessary there for data parallelism training. So what we found is that it's, uh, we actually had compute resources, but none of the researchers would actually change their model to use this just because it was too hard for them. Um, also, we found architectural problems. Architectural problem is with parameter server, you pretty much have choice. Either you have one parameter server and all the workers talk to it, uh, in which case your parameter server will get overloaded and you will have bottleneck on both network and CPU. Or you can spread, you can have many parameter servers. Either you will have one parameter server per worker or you will have some smaller number of them. In that case, your um, CPU or your averaging device will be OK, but your network will not be happy because your, all the nodes will be talking to each other. Uh, so we were, and then this is an example of TensorFlow training script. 
Uh, there is a lot of code, so that's why it's kind of small font. Uh, this is from their official website. Then we run benchmarks, and we saw that, as we suspected, things don't really scale well. And this is as of 1.3. Uh, so we were saying that at 128 GPUs, we would start to see maybe about 50-ish percent scale efficiency. So we would be throwing away half of GPUs. So we needed to do something about that because GPUs are expensive. Uh, so there is things that we can improve, so what are those? Um, one thing is we wanted to rethink whether all the separations that existed for parameter server case were actually necessary for data parallel training. Uh, because data parallels should be pretty simple. You basically have a model, you just want to run it on many machines. That's it. That's conceptually everything that you want to know. Um, we wanted to improve communication algorithm. So instead of doing one to all or all to all, we wanted to do something more efficient. And then we wanted to use RDMA capable network just because our data center had it and nothing was using it so far. Um, so, and then it, we wanted to use both InfiniBand or Rocky. Uh, so that's why we made Horvat. So Horvat is a distributed training framework for TensorFlow. Uh, it uh, gets, you can install it on side of TensorFlow, so you can already install either production version of TensorFlow or something that you build on your own with some customizations. Then uh, Horvath installs on the side of it, uh, and you don't need to recompile TensorFlow because of that. It's inspired by uh, many HPC ideas that were floating around in that time by Facebook and Baidu. Uh, it can use um, RDMA, so it can use anything band, Rocky. Uh, and then it's named after Russian dance, where everybody is kind of dancing in a circle. So how does it work? You guys probably all know about a ring goal reduce. So this is exactly what it's using. Uh, so basically, the idea of ring goal reduce is if you partition your data on every worker, every worker would uh, spend n, two n iterations doing this data averaging. And what's going to happen is first n iterations, every worker will talk to two other workers and exchange bits of data and add them as displayed on this picture. And then second and minus one iterations, it would uh, just send the data. So after first time, you will have ground truth for each um, chunk of your data on one of the workers. And then second and iterations is spent to spread the truth among all the participants. <coughs> the interesting thing about this methodology is that every worker would only talk to two adjacent workers which really helps your networking because uh, within a rack, you would only have, um, basically pretty much everything will be concentrated within a rack. And then your rack would only need to talk to other racks for one node. Instead of for where you have all to all, you would have to have every worker from one rack talk to every worker from other rack. That would be much more efficient. So let's talk about Harvard stack. So how does it work? Uh, as I said, it's a plugin. So it uses a TensorFlow custom operation mechanism, which many other plugins use as well. Uh, it uses MPI for discovery and worker coordination. Uh, the reason we need this um, coordination is because, in, especially in case of TensorFlow, when you have um, computation graphs where for example, you would have uh, two layers in parallel. TensorFlow does not prescribe what will be the order of when those gradients for those layers will be computed. So we assume that the order can be random, and we basically have a mechanism where every worker, when it knows that it has computed certain gradients, it will notify master worker about that using very small MPI messages. And then master worker will instruct everybody to reduce certain things when it knows that everybody has ability to do so. Uh, so we use, and then we can use MPI or NVIDIA Nickel for doing actual reduction of those gigabyte size tensors. So Nickel is uh, NVIDIA's all reduced library to do collective communication, which is all reduced, all gather, broadcast, and a few others. Uh, and it's super optimized to do so among GPUs. And so we use that primarily for um, doing the scaling. So here is an example of like similar example to what I was showing before, but now using Horvath. 
So here I will show you a few things. Basically, the only things that you need to add to your typical single GPU TensorFlow code is those bold parts. And there is just pretty much four things that you need to add. One is you need to initialize it. Then you need to tell TensorFlow which uh, GPU to use for this process, because by default TensorFlow uses all the GPUs that it can find, even though it's going to actually use one, but it's going to allocate memory on all of them. So this prescribes it to use specific GPU per process. Uh, and then you just need to wrap whatever optimizer you like to use. Many data scientists like to use Adagrad optimizer, for example, with distributed optimizer. So what that will do is it would um, spread, um, introduce this all reduce operation between computing gradients and applying them. Uh, and then in order to make sure that your model will uh, all start from the same place, you need to add this um, broadcast hook, which I will describe a little later. And then what we also found is that a lot of researchers actually like to use high-level APIs like Keras, uh, and especially in our company. Um, and we decided to implement, extend this support to Keras as well. So you can see that with about the same amount of complexity and kind of same concepts, you can uh, add distributed training using Keras. And then recently Google released this estimator API and some people were starting to use that. So we had a support for estimator API as well. And as you can see, in all three cases, concepts are all the same, um, APIs are very similar, so it becomes easy for people to, um, once they know how to distribute one way of doing TensorFlow, they can grab the model from other researcher or from open source and distribute that other model equally easy. Uh, so how do we run Horvath? So you basically use MPI, uh, and this is simple commands how to do MPI. Most of you guys know those things. Uh, for people who are scared of running MPI, um, the premise is that this should only be set up by people who are managing the cluster. So basically you will have kind of infrastructure team which can set up NPI, set up Horovod, Nickel, uh, and provide some sort of convenience wrapper around NPI run that people can execute. And then for them, it's basically NPI run, Python, my training script.py. Um, but for, let's say, HPC, uh, this can equally well work on, um, I think somebody was trying to use it on Cray MPI. I know that people try to use it on Intel MPI as well. It definitely works on MV AppPeach and um, the other one, MPeach as well. So it should work without problems on pretty much any MPI implementation. If it doesn't work on yours, then please raise us an uh, issue and we'll fix it. Um, and then, so also as we were developing Horovod, we found that it's interesting, interestingly hard for us to understand what's happening because now that you're running it on, let's say, 100 GPUs, you will have 100 processes, and you, have, you do have things like um, NVV, NV Profiler, which will spit out traces for every single GPU, and you have things like TensorFlow um, Profiler, which will give you information about what ran on every TensorFlow instance. But the problem is, it was super hard to correlate those things together when you were kind of wanted to know what's where your outliers are, if, is there any specific GPUs that are causing problems and what's happening with the system at the high level. So we added this uh, Horvat timeline, which is kind of similar to TensorFlow. Um, so what it does, it will show you the state of the whole cluster and how it was um, doing these reduction operations. So on the, there is this tick marks that basically during this stage is where um, all the workers will notify master about when they're ready to reduce. And if this stage is long, that means that there was delay between those notifications, which could be because some asynchronous or asymmetrical load, which may lead to degradation, or just because they were busy doing some other stuff. Um, then it shows how all reduce was happening, whether, whether it was due to um, slowness in nickel, slowness in copying data, or some other thing. Uh, so this helped us investigate why REST Net 152 would take more time to be reduced than others, and it turned out that it has about four something hundred super small tensors, which is maybe 500 bytes each.